Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Jigyasa Analytics webinar from Data to Deals Machine Learning Driven Inbound Lead Optimization. My name is Krishna Mehta, and I'm one of the co founders in Jigyasa, and will be taking you through the presentation today. So, the first question we need to ask ourselves is why do we need to prioritize inbound leads? So, look. Sales and marketing teams are limited resources. There are a limited number of people and all leads are not equal. There might be frivolous leads. There might be leads which will not lead to the same amount of purchase or the frequency of purchase. There might be people who might not be ready to buy now and will not buy till uh, a few months down the road. And so because of this, we need to have smart prioritization uh, plans to make sure that the best sales people uh, and the most sales time is focused on where the conversion has the highest chance. And this issue is further compounded by the fact that a lot of organizations sell multiple products or services. And, and the customer might be a fit for a certain kind of service or product. And based on that, they might need to be pushed towards a certain sales cycle or certain sales path. Because of all this, we need to have a system in place to prioritize inbound leads. Now this, the output of something like this would be one resource optimization limited sales capacity would be channeled to target the best prospects based on our optimization system but an additional output of this process will be product alignment where customers profiles would be used to match them to the best possible product and this might not be just a single product but it might be a rank order of the products they are likely to be interested in. Let us now talk briefly about the challenges one is likely to face when doing lead optimization. The first thing is that speed really matters. Uh, the leads who come to your site might be looking at competitors. They might be need to make a decision fast or someone else will get uh, to them and make them their customers. Because of all these reasons, you need to be really quick in your response. Speed really matters. It has to be real time or very close to real time. And this challenge is compounded by data scarcity. Unlike more traditional scoring scenarios where there is a lot of data over here, the first party data collected might be scarce. And we'll talk more about it in the uh, uh, next slide. But <clears throat> the data scarcity is a big issue. There might be just some web form data they filled out. There might be just some uh, uh, weblog data we collect from them uh, and uh, on top of it the data might be incomplete they might not fill have filled out all the forms and all the fields required and and we might be able to enhance it with additional enrichments but data scarcity is an issue and so we have to plan a system where it extracts the most possible information from the available data. And then the third thing which puts a constraint on the modeling algorithm is that it should be something that can be scored in real time. It should be able to work with a limited amount of data and respond within the real time framework. It should align with the real time framework and be this output should be, be able to fed into the decision making mechanism. So these are some of the challenges with setting up a good lead optimization system. We talked about 
uh, how data is scarce in this application. So th it might be a good time for us to go through what kind of data is generally available to us. So uh, the first thing is that we might be collecting some kind of web form data. So this could be the name of the individual. If it is B2B, it might be the organization, the email, physical address, phone number. One thing to keep in mind is greater the number amount of information taken, the more likely the abandonment. So um, organizations generally try to keep this to bare necessary, which unfortunately means that modelers have to deal with even less data, but uh, also uh, all for all the fields might not be populated, and that leads to is additional complexity. And the other kind of data that is available is web log intelligence. Again, this might be technical. This is basically technical metadata. It might be about uh, the type of device they use, the type of browser they use, the time they uh, came in. Uh, then there might be some information about geography, there might be some information about the referral source, but essentially this is kind of the technical metadata which is available and can lead to very useful insights. And then the third uh, thing which uh, or some organizations might do is they might enrich the data they get uh, by using uh, other formographic, formographic or demographic data. This uh, would be uh, third-party data enhancements. They might have it on-site or they might be using an API call to get this data. But uh, <coughs> this would be things about the individual's behavior or the firm's characteristics and the individual's characteristics as well. Uh, so this is the kind of data that is generally available for uh, developing a lead optimization system. Next, I would like to spend some time to talk to you about the kind of insights one can generate from the limited amount of first party data that we collect. The first thing is that email addresses are so predictive and carry wealth of information and signals uh, which are hidden there. First take the domain like uh, things like AOL, Yahoo, Hotmail might uh, imply an older audience, uh, whereas Gmail might be mixed or younger. There might be uh, uh, .edu or there might be other domains which uh, imply educational or professional audience. Uh, and so just looking at the domain, there might be a lot of learning about the age even uh, some indication about the financial well-being as well as uh, the professional uh, status of that individual. Now let's take the first part of that email address. Over there, what we have found in our studies is the length of the email, whether uh, it actually corresponds to names, uh, uh, then patterns, in letters there, things like that might be able to identify frivolous submissions from ones where the individual is more serious about the product. Then in fact, if one is set up to do text mining and certain email addresses might give certain additional information about gender, ethnicity as well. So, so all this gives a wealth of information. And then there is the weblog data, mm -hmm. the time they came in. There's so much of information hidden there. The day of the week, uh, people uh, 
putting in the submission uh, uh, on a weekend might be very different in terms of their purchase behavior than people uh, putting in their information on a weekday. People putting in their information uh, and coming to the website uh, during office hours might be very different from those who uh, do it in the evening. And so all this is very, very useful information the model can learn from. And then if available, source attribution also gives very rich insights, whether it was coming from organic search or paid ads, referral, whether it's a direct uh, visit to the website, provides so very strong indicators of the kind of product they might be interested in and the product preference, the likelihood of purchase, all of this. So uh, even though this data seems scarce, uh, when properly harvested, it can lead to so many direct and indirect insights. Let us now talk a bit about data enrichment strategies. So uh, third party data enrichment can dramatically improve the leads insights if you are depending firmographic data for B2B or demographic data for B2C and behavioral data. All this will help you make richer predictions about the sales uh, and the likelihood of sales. However, uh, it all depends on match quality. Uh, not all leads will be successfully matched, not all leads will be correctly matched. So one of the things you have to decide when you are setting it up is what kind of threshold you would accept for match quality. And then uh, once you have uh, fixed that, from our experience what we see that this match rate can vary from 40% to 80%. And depending on the quality of the data collected and what kind of data you are matching it to, this is the variance, which means you have to account for 20 to 60 percent of your leads. What are you going to do with them? So there is this critical thing you have to do that you have to have another set of models in place uh, for your unmatched leads. These will be worked on only based on the uh, email data we have, the web log data we have, the form data we have. And for the others who match, you can have a richer model uh, uh, for, uh, based on the data you have enriched it with. And then you have to have a system by which you reconcile the leads uh, scores generated from the two different sets of models so that the best prospects are uh, targeted using uh, uh, both the models. So let us now talk about the analytics system design that we will need to put in place. Of course, the first thing that will have to happen as we talked in the previous slide is the matching. Now, once the matching is done, uh, we will have essentially two parts. The matched enrichment path, which leverages both the collected uh, form data and the web data, as, as well as the appended third party enrichment data for comprehensive scoring. And then we will have the unmatched lead path, which relies exclusively on the first party collected data. Uh, and we will uh, have to have a reconciliation mechanism so that the best leads from both get prioritized to our sales team. Now, uh, the kind of models which will be under both the parts have to be purchase probability models. So these would kind of classify the uh, likelihood of purchase uh, based on the available data signals and that data, those data signals would be different for the different parts. And then there would be a product prediction model uh, which would identify the product which the prospect is most likely to be interested in. And this might not be just one product, 
we might have a system where the products are ranked and uh, we get the most likely product and then the next best product and so on and an organization might put in just some variants of this this is kind of the broad spectrum and for example for some organizations the multiple products might not be needed um, for others they might not be doing enhancements and enrichments so based on that this path and this design will be simplified or modified I want to now talk to you a little bit about the implementation strategy for putting in place this lead scoring mechanism. So the first thing which is very important is you should build feedback loops which incorporate continuous learning mechanisms so that the models can improve and they observe outcomes and conversions over time. Doing this not only helps the models get stronger but as the market changes or your customer base changes or the kind of leads coming in changes, the model, model will be robust and adapt to it. So it's very important to have this feedback loop in place. The next thing is system integration. Make sure that it is easy for the salespeople to use the model, integrate it with Salesforce or whatever CRM you are using to uh, yeah, and doing that, having this right in front of the salespeople integrated will increase the adoption rate of the model and lead to successful outcomes. And then it's very important to start simple and scale smart. Begin with the foundational components of the basic model and then progressively add sophistication. That way you will learn more, you will not make mistakes or you will not make bigger mistakes. You'll be able to correct them sooner. So one way could be you just start working with the uh, probability of purchase model first and then you go to the other model related to product recommendation later. Also, you could start working only with first party data and then bring in third party data later once you have the first party data figured out. All this will make the rollout less complex, less uh, uh, components to control at any stage and lead to greater success. <clears throat> and then monitor and evaluate. Uh, this leads a little bit to the first point I made about feedback loop, but it is kind of different because the feedback loop can be automated, but it is very important to also have a human oversight over the process. Maybe periodically someone goes in and evaluates the results. Uh, the organization might be very excited because the models might be giving very good conversion rates, but there might be pockets it's ignoring where it's not doing as well and doing the analysis to identify there can lead to even better results for the organization. So it's very important to have this baked in there as well. And so the key takeaway is success requires balancing the technical sophistication with practical implementation. Start with what you can measure and improve and gradually build up to have a very successful lead optimization program in place. I hope you found this webinar useful and informative. Uh, uh, we will move to question and answers next, but please sign up for our upcoming webinars and we would love to have you back.